Okay, we'll go ahead and get started on uh, kind of the first lecture in this course, which is um, an introduction to what's called Node, uh, as well as a, a review of some JavaScript coding. And so that's kind of the, the two topics uh, that we're going to hit on today is a, is a new topic being Node and a little bit of a review, uh, be it that uh, myself personally, um, need, I haven't been in the JavaScript world in about five or six months. And so, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, a review of uh, a lot of JavaScript fundamentals as well. Um, and so this course does not have a textbook, but what we do have is uh, some uh, reading assignments, if you will, that's a compiled um document that has been created and maintained um, on on different topics and so you know yes there's no textbook but no that doesn't mean there's no reading we do ask that you guys um, uh, do some various reading assignments and you know it's day one of the class and so you can see here there's a ton of of reading on node of course we're going to hit the high level notes here on um, of, of this uh, what is node and um, how to use it um, so that's kind of the, the first link here um, this second document the lecture outline this is basically what I'm going to be using um, for um, for my guideline um, kind of a different format instead of having a PowerPoint put together it's just some talking points and so if you want to pull up that um, lecture outline, um, that's, that's kind of what we're going to go through before, um, um, you know, in this lecture, in this recording. And then the third thing that you'll have that we'll go through is this JavaScript handout. And this is just another document that we've compiled, um, kind of going through some different um, bits and pieces of JavaScript. Okay. So to kind of start with the lecture outline, um, the first question there is what is Node? Um, so we'll pull this up and kind of consolidate down. We've got our lecture outline, we've got our handout, uh, and learn Node. So those are our three tabs. Um, and minimize all the other tabs that we have open. Um, and so if you go through here, you know, obviously there's a lot to read about Node, um, but I've really condensed that down. Um, and so, you know, um, there's different um, terms that we use in the development world, uh, be it, you know, IDE, right? What is an IDE? Well integrated developers environment whatever it's a it's a tool that you write code in and so our IDE in this class is uh, VS code right and that's just kind of a common uh, term that we you'll hear a lot in, in the developer world is what IDE are you in um, you you also hear uh, libraries and you know frameworks and in both libraries and frameworks um, you know, are basically other people's code. And so when you're working with a library, you know, you're kind of bringing in that library into your project so you can write code utilizing the code that other people have written. Um, whereas a, a framework, um, it tends to be a bigger tool, but it's still kind of some code that someone else has written. Um, but, but both libraries and frameworks kind of refer to other people's code. Um, and so when I think of Node, um, you, this is another term that you see a lot uh, in, this, in this industry, is a runtime environment. Um, and so Node is a runtime environment for JavaScript. Now, you know, if you took the first year class, you know that JavaScript runs in a browser, right? And so you wrote in your first semester class, you wrote what was considered to be front-end JavaScript. 
And when you ran that JavaScript in first semester, you know, it ran in Chrome or it ran in Internet Explorer, or it ran in Firefox. But, you know, um, these different browsers have um, what are called JavaScript engines. And, and they might not all have the same engine, right? Internet Explorer might have a different engine than Chrome, might have a different engine than Firefox, right? And if, if you know anything about browsers and browser history, um, Chrome always has the reputation for being fast. And the reason Chrome has a reputation for being fast is primarily because of its engine for JavaScript. And so, that engine is, you know, I, I'm not necessarily a car guy, but I do know what a V8 engine is. You know, I think that's kind of a cool name uh, for a JavaScript engine. Basically, the, the engine built into Chrome was called the V8 engine. And um, it's really because of that, that JavaScript engine that was built into Chrome somewhere in like the 2010, 2010 time frame. That Chrome got the reputation for being fast. It's because it ran your JavaScript fast. Um, but Chrome, uh, or excuse me, JavaScript always ran in the browser. And so, you know, kind of, kind of going through the history of JavaScript, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting history. JavaScript was a language that was developed uh, at Mozilla in, in like less than a week, um, is my understanding. Like JavaScript as a language itself uh, was like thrown together. And it's always been a language that, um, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be like a developer's primary language. Like you would develop in C++ or you develop in uh, PHP or, you know, JavaScript was kind of always, it was never like given the, the respect of like, yeah, I'm a developer, my primary language is JavaScript. Um, and it wasn't until Node came out, uh, which is this basically this way of running JavaScript. It's a runtime environment for running it outside of a browser. Okay, so kind of like using my cheat sheet over here, you kind of see a history of Node. Um, you know, Node was born in, in 2009, um, and so it hasn't um, been around that long and um, you know again I'm just kind of highlighting that it's a runtime environment that allowed you to run JavaScript outside of the browser and when developers started being able to write JavaScript outside of the browser they're able to build full stack applications you could build not only full stack web applications but you could build desktop apps and so if you kind of look at some of the apps that have been built uh, in JavaScript, um, you know, for example, Visual Studio Code itself. Visual Studio Code um, was, was built with this tool called the Electron. Ultimately, it was written with JavaScript. Um, same thing with Discord. Discord was built with Electron and JavaScript. And so once Node was kind of built and created, runs on this fast JavaScript engine called V8 that was part of Chrome. And then it started becoming, well, now we can like update, uh, essentially kind of update JavaScript. Um, and it really was the beginning of the boom of JavaScript as a language. And so now developers, I mean, JavaScript can be your dominant language. And in fact, it's been like the most popular language for like the past 10 years. Um, I always kind of defer to um, uh, the developer survey on Stack Overflow. And if you kind of look at this, and I think there's a 2023 one, um, you know, if you look at the like popular technologies, you could see that JavaScript is basically is basically uh, the king of of coding languages, and and it's been that way for maybe well maybe ten years, really since Node has come out. And so you know, with this release of Node, we can run JavaScript out of the browser. 
it allowed for essentially updates to the language. Like you, you might remember uh, what's called ECMAScript, E-C-M-A, ECMAScript. And if you go to the ECMAScript wiki, you can kind of see that um, JavaScript it basically goes through uh, new features every year. And so a new version of JavaScript um, is kind of built um, is kind of built out. Now this looks a little different than I remember. Um, but starting in about 2015, um, they started having, you know, what's called ES6, ES7, you know, and these different versions, which really essentially what that boils down is to like newer versions of JavaScript. And so that was all kind of put in place because of, um, you know, being able to do more with JavaScript than just kind of really what was JavaScript used for. You could do like form validation. You could do like calculations with JavaScript. It was kind of like nice. You could do like animations with JavaScript. And there was a library called jQuery that kind of had things transitioning on and off the page. But it was always just kind of like a, a little, like nice little language to know on the side. And now it can be like a dominant, you know, uh, force um, is like a dominant language. And it's really because of Node that allows you to do that. Um, and so that's what, that's what Node is. When I think of Node, I think of it as a runtime environment that allows you to run JavaScript out of a browser. And what does that mean? Well, you can run Node on all sorts of devices. Uh, you can turn a computer um, uh, into a into a web server. You know, I know, you know, you could run Node on on any desktop. You can run Node um, on on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you could turn a little Raspberry Pi device into a web server um, by by installing Node in some of these these different libraries that are built on top of Node. Uh, so when you in install what's called Express, you turn you turn a Raspberry Pi or a desktop or a laptop, you install Express, you turn it into a web server. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so that's what Node is. It's a runtime environment for running JavaScript. It's built on V8. Um, you know, you can kind of check your version of Node. We, we went through the... Uh, how to install Node at this nodejs.org, and you can check your version by going to the command prompt and typing in node slash v. And you can kind of see here we got version uh, 18.6, and you can even type in um, like an interactive mode if you just type in node. This kind of gives you like a little is really kind of useless. It kind of gives you a little uh, uh, command prompt to run JavaScript in. So I could do hello plus world and it'll actually execute some JavaScript for you. This is a, a terminal um, to run JavaScript in, although it's not useful. Uh, you know, it, it is proving that I am running JavaScript outside uh, of a browser. In this case, I'm running it in a terminal. Um, and so, you know, this isn't all that useful. What is more useful would be to go to your IDE, be it Visual Studio Code. And what I'll do is I'll just kind of spin up a um, kind of an empty folder to write some, some code in. So I'll just make an empty folder and I'll right click that folder. And earlier I was talking about that little checkbox that I like to check um, that'll allow this open with code option to kind of be there. So during the installer, if you check the checkbox right, you'll have this little install option to uh, open with code. And so that's a nice little shortcut that's nice. And uh, sure, I trust the authors, it's me. And I'll close the welcome screen and I'll kind of start up a new file and I'll type in index.js. And so we have a little script here. And now um, we can kind of write a little bit more useful JavaScript. 
not in a, a terminal window necessarily, but instead we'll write a script and then we'll execute that script. Again, we used to execute that script in a browser and now we can execute it uh, essentially at a um, command prompt. And um, to kind of demonstrate that, I'll go terminal, new terminal. And it kind of boots up a, a PowerShell window. You know, a PowerShell window is a kind of an advanced user's command prompt. Um, but you can kind of see it, it booted up a, a PowerShell window down here that I can run commands in. Um, and so if I were to just do a console log, which you probably remember from first semester, and I just do a little hello world and I save it, um, you know, this is a command prompt window. So if I type in dir, I can see that I've, I can see what's in my folder, right? I got my one script file here. I can go up a directory with cd dot dot. So if you know any command line commands, we can kind of traverse the directory structure, go up and down and kind of look around at what's going on. CLS for clear screen. Um, but essentially what I can do is I can type in node index.js and it runs JavaScript, right? So does my little, little world. And so, you know, hopefully we've introduced Node. Hopefully, you know, it's just a way to run JavaScript outside of the browser. This is allowed for all sorts of, basically, you know, another good way of looking at it is, you know, you can run JavaScript on a server now, right? It used to be client side. JavaScript used to be nothing but client side, but now it can be client side and server side. And so because of that, you can use one language, JavaScript, to do full stack development, both the front end, what the user sees, and the back end, what runs on the server. You can basically write these scripts and run these scripts on a server, right? So, so Node is that tool that allows you to do full stack front-end JavaScript, which you already have been introduced, and back-end JavaScript, which it runs on a server. Um, and so that's kind of the, the short version of what, what Node is. Um, now another uh, a command is npm slash v, and let's see if I kind of pull this in here. Um, NPM stands for Node Package Manager. I'm kind of curious what version you guys have. If you guys run this in the terminal, what version pulls up for you guys? I don't think it makes a big difference, but I'm just curious. I got 951. I'm on 951. Okay, 951. So I'm, I'm going to guess Josh is the same while he's pulling that up. Um, Remember that it used to be that we have to we had to install a plugin to get npm, um, but now it's kind of built into Visual Studio. So it's not surprising that we're on the same version because we just updated Visual Studio today. So we're going to have the same version of npm because that kind of comes with Visual Studio now, which it not used to not be. Okay, nine five one. Yeah, so we're all on the same version. Um, Again, so what Node is, is allows you to run JavaScript outside of the browser, like on a server. NPM allows you to download other packages and maintain the, those packages. And so we'll, we'll kind of do a deeper dive on NPM uh, as we get into this class. But NPM, again, Node Package Manager, allows you to download other JavaScript packages and uh, as a manager might do, allows you to maintain those um, packages. And so, you know, as new versions of Bootstrap come out, do you, do you update your application to the latest version or do you keep your older version, that kind of, that kind of uh, story? Um, okay, so back to my notes. You can use Node in interactive mode, but we usually run scripts. We talked about that. Uh, scripts are written in JavaScript and have an extension of JS. Yep, we got that. And we got our VS Code introduction. We got that. So that's kind of our that's kind of our introduction to Node um, before we kind of uh, jump into the JavaScript review. Um, 
The JavaScript review um, is this handout here um, that will go through. I'm going to pull mine up to another window. You guys have access to this handout on Inside Rankin. Um, and I'll kind of pull up my code editor as I write some code. Um, so in JavaScript, and again, it's been about five or six months, so I'm going to be getting into this myself for the first time in a while. Um, there's basically three ways to create variables. There's the keyword var. There's let. And there's const. Um, and these are all kind of three valid ways to declare variables. And um, curious, uh, Grant, uh, you just got done with this class. Did you use a whole lot of one and not the others? Which ones did, are you familiar with? Um, we didn't use any bar, I think. Okay. So that was out, like JavaScript was saying, that was outdated more or less on the current versions. So it was all um, let and const. Good. That's that's a good answer, right? And so um, that's more or less the recommendation. If you look at if you look at the var keyword, notice you see a bunch of red. Like if you're just looking at that document, um, you know red is bad green is good and so um you can see there's just a bunch of red uh in, under var and so you say you didn't use var uh, that's good you know in the old days of javascript before 2015 um you know that was basically your only option was var and you can kind of see um it's it's called function scoped uh, it's typically, VARs are typically hoisted, are brought up to global scope. Um, and the problem with being global scope variables is that, you know, I write a script, you write a script, he writes a script. We all, you know, our websites, they link to 50 JavaScript files. And if they're all kind of using VAR and then... I use a variable name and then someone else uses that same variable name on a totally different script and they're both in global scope, those, that's going to cause conflict, right? So global scope might sound attractive, but in reality it causes more headaches and, and conflicts than anything else. Um, um, and so you can kind of see there it can be redeclared within the same scope. And so... Uh, you could have var x of 12, and then I could have another function down here. And I could say var x again, and I've redeclared x. And now, now what is x? Is x 2 or is x 12? Uh, what's going on here? And, and you know, JavaScript developers just kind of got used to this, and they, you know, they had to understand when they're operating in here in the function that x was 2, but operating outside, x is 12. And so, again, that caused more confusion. Point is, we don't use var. Uh, since 2015, like, to TLDR, too long didn't read, just don't use var. Um, you're, you're basically, when you're looking at JavaScript, you're looking at these two options, let and const. These are the updated ways of creating uh, variables. If you're looking at code and you see a bunch of vars, um, then you know that either that code was written a long time ago or you know that the developer who's writing it has not updated their JavaScript skills, right, since 2015. Um, and so um, it boils down to both of these are considered block scope. Um, which is considered good, um, you know, it's it's kind of scoped to the block that you're in. Uh, and so if you have a function, that's a block. If you have an if statement, that's a block. You know, blocks are basically defined with curly braces. And so whenever you're defining something inside of those curly braces, you know, that's your block of code. Inside of those curly braces, it's in scope. Outside of those curly braces, it's out of scope. And so you know, you're not going to get the global scope conflicts and problems that would arise if you're using uh, VAR. 
Um, and so, so these are our two options, right? And it boils down to this. Um, the recommendation is to um, use const for all variables unless you need to reassign the variable. Okay, so um, one thing that you'll see um, in that chart is you see that objects are mutable. And so that's just an interesting thing about const. The way um, um, so here's an ont. Uh, 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 here's a here's a uh, an object. Here's an ont. Um, we'll get this camel named. And see that that kind of gets rid of that, and uh, syntax is with a colon. So here's here's a JavaScript object. Um, it's person, and if I do a console log person dot first name, and I run, if I just push the up arrow, it'll spit out my name. Okay. Um, um, even though this is const, you might think constant. It's kind of a weird thing. Um, constant variables or const variables, you can still update. Um, you can still update a an object that's even marked with const. So if I go person dot first name equals Josh, and now I update that. And I rerun it. See, uh, objects are in fact mutable. Their properties are mutable. Um, so that's kind of the one thing to keep in mind. And, and it's kind of um, what const means is that you cannot reassign the whole um, the whole uh, object. And so if I were to try and do something like like this is legal, right? Person dot first name. But if I were to go down here now, I were to say person equals like this, uh, first name, um, it's Grant, right? Grant, yep, first name of Grant, and comma, last name, oops. I'll just say D. Um, now when I try and run this, okay, now we get now we get a problem because we're actually trying to reassign the object. Okay, so 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 um, just it's it's kind of a weird thing to say const isn't constant. What it means is you can't you can't reassign. That is true. You cannot reassign. You can assign it once, like here's our object, we're assigning it once, and then you can update the properties, right, because this is a first name property of our person object. Um, but but here's kind of the, the, the thing about const, is if you ever use that equal assign, keep in mind equal sign is the assignment operator, and if you ever go to reassign, a const variable, that's where you're going to get some errors, as, as demonstrated. Okay, um, so, so what it boils down to is, uh, these are your two options, uh, let in const. If you only need to assign it one time and never reassign it, just go ahead and use const. However, if your variables need reassignment, um, then, then you need to use let. And so the recommendation is just for to make it as clean as possible, use const for all of your variables. And then only when it kind of like errors out, like it just demonstrated, if it errors out because you try to reassign it, then just go back and change it to a let. And 
And that's kind of the way of like writing strict, right? That's writing kind of some strict JavaScript. You're not going to accidentally, you know, reassign a variable that's not supposed to be. Making sense, Grant? You hanging in there? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. And uh, was that, you just came out of the class. Was that some new information anywhere in there? Or is it kind of like, oh, I've heard all that before? Um, I mean, it was mostly what I've heard, but I never really thought of just using the const kind of as a default almost. I probably ended up using let's where I didn't have to. So I I like hearing that, like, use const until you get an error, basically, and to clean it up. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, that, that was something that kind of um, stuck with me. And, and I'm with you. I, 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 might even, I might not follow my own advice, but I, I should, <laughs> you know. Uh, use use const until otherwise um, uh, n necessary. Um, okay, and so um, data types in JavaScript. So that's those are our variables, and those are the difference. Um, you know, everything's block scoped, and so you know variables are kind of in scope in their block, and they're out of scope outside of their block. You don't really need to. You know, I guess if I were to um, kind of make a function and declare my variable in my function and and do a console log y, you know, this would be this would be good because that's in scope. Um, I need to call my function. So declare my function, call my function. Um, it is it is worth noting, you know, um, functions are hoisted up the call stack, so you can actually declare a function. You can call it before you declare it. Um, so that's kind of something that's interesting in JavaScript. You don't have to declare it first and then call it like this. You can do like I did before, and you can call it before you declare the function. And it works just the same. So obviously this line right here, foo with the semicolon is calling my function. And then line seven is declaring the function. So, so there you go. Um, but if I were to kind of do console log here, I would expect that to error out because of the scope. And you can see here y is not defined. It is considered out of scope. It's a block scoped variable that's what that means um, and you one more note cannot be redeclared within the same scope so let's do this um, let's create a y out here let y equals 2 and then in here I redeclare my variable let me get rid of that error so so here I've kind of got the same variable declared twice and um, um, let's see, it prints out, it does allow me to, I kind of would have expected that to error out, cannot be redeclared within same scope. Um, this is not something that I do every day because it's really not the best practice to have two different variables with the same name. Uh, but let's look at this. So here I declare a y, and I declare it again y, and I call foo here. Maybe I didn't save. You know what? I didn't save this little circle here. See the circle? Maybe I didn't save. Control S. Now that goes away. Let's run this again. Um... So here, I guess we have, technically what we have is two different scopes. We have the scope of the file. Let's try and do this. Let y equals three. Okay, now this is, this is technically now the same scope. Um, whereas, let's try this. Let's just change this up to var. You see that's gonna allow it to happen. So var, it allowed you to redeclare in the same scope, but let did not. And I actually got a compiler error. And I'm not sure if uh, that's because of the linters that I have installed or not. But let's just run that. There we go. That's, that's the error message I was expecting. 
It says Y has already been declared. It's in the same scope. Um, technically speaking, this is a, a different scope. It's a different block, which makes sense. So what, what we had before, if I kind of control Z, um, when I had, I had this kind of uh, um, file scoped, it's scoped to this entire block of code in the entire file, whereas this is a function, it is, it is scoped to this function. And what you, what you would have in that case is the function y uh, scope would take precedence over the file scope. So that's why you kind of saw the, the 12 2. Okay, so now we've hit all those different points about uh, the different kinds of variables. And there's a little um, kind of a neat little article about why you shouldn't use var anymore. Um, and it just boils down to what we already talked about. You're just going to encounter less problems when you use const and let. Okay. Um, data types. Um, It's kind of an interesting topic, uh, data types in JavaScript, because they're not as, there's not as many. Like we just came from C Sharp, and there are all these different data types. And I would say the data types in JavaScript are just more broadly scoped or, or broadly defined. Um, and so, um, there's kind of a neat little type of. And so if I do type of Z, and I do a, I put that in a console.log, this type of operator will return a data type. And so if I run, you know, Z is going to return back, this is a string. Um, and so to kind of go through, you can see that that's, that is one type. If I do type of Y, you know, um, you get the type of number. Um, so what what is this? You know, this is uh, you know basically dynamic typing. Uh, dynamic typing um, means basically the engine, the JavaScript engine, as we kind of talked about, it's V8, V8 uh, picks the appropriate data type at runtime. And so we don't have to say this is a string, this is a this is a number, this is an object. We don't we don't have to declare a data type. Um, basically, the engine will pick the data type at runtime that it thinks it's appropriate. Most of the time, the engine picks the right data type. Not always. Um, you know, a very common example of that. If I say like uh, const x is a string to, const y is a string to, and I council log, you know, maybe you actually want to do some addition here. Um, now, it is, it is in fact a string, and of course what happens when you add strings, you might want the output to be uh, four, but you get concatenation instead, right? So sometimes your intent might not match the data type that's assigned because we, we assigned it a string. It's just doing what it knows how to do, which is string concatenation. Um, and to fix that, really, there's a couple, you know, if we just do like a parse int and you could just take one of those. If you have like an integer two plus a, a string two, um, let's, let's parse int on both of them. Control S and run that. There, there you're going to get your addition of four. Um, so you saw if you had two strings, you added them together, you got concatenation. If you had a number and a string, you got concatenation. It's only when you had two number data types that it actually did addition. Um, addition is the only one that causes that problem, by the way. If I did this, if I said 
x minus y. Um, and I were to run that, uh, the engine's like, ah, uh, I know what that means. I, I know to actually do some subtraction. So really it's addition that really causes the problem here. It's not, uh, it's, it's just certain scenarios. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, let's do const x and let's do a console log type of x. Uh, let's do let x. Okay, so, and if you um, kind of run that, x is, until you assign a value, x is known as undefined. So undefined is, is a type. Uh, it is, um, you know, you haven't assigned it. So undefined means no assigned value. So unassigned means no assigned value, a.k.a., you know, there's no equal sign, which is the assignment operator. Okay, so that's x. Uh, we can do let x equals true console log type of x. And, of course, another type that we have is Boolean. Um, if we do x, kind of go back to my person example. Typically, we'll do const person equals Curly's first name colon Evan. And I do type of person. And I run that. We're going to get a data type of object. Um, there is a data type of big int. I haven't experimented with this, but let's just let's just put a big int in. So let's say const big num equals and and let's see if that gives us a big int. Well, let's do console log. See if it's quote unquote big enough type of big num. And not quite big enough. Let's see if we put more digits. Save it. Refresh it. Um, I'm not sure where the line may be, how to get this type of to be big int. That seems pretty big. How to force it to be a big int. Um, let's take a quick look at this. So kind of a um, resource that's really helpful for learning JavaScript and all these fundamentals is the uh, Mozilla Developer Network, so MDN Web Docs. Um, so MDN has a type on, uh, or a little page on BigInt. BigInt is a numeric type that can represent integers in the arbitrary precision format. Um, JavaScript type of big int. Okay, so we're showing the data types are changing. funny you actually you literally have to convert it um, so it is a very interesting number that literally has to be hard cast you know we're casting this property into a big int so let's kind of go back to my code demo since that's not working, by the way, you know that, to forward slash. Um, so if I kind of put this in my console log, just to demonstrate that there is a type of, and there we go, 
clearly not something you see every day. Okay. Um, let's go back to our docks here. Okay. Not worth getting hung up on it. I don't really see that all too often. Big int is created by appending an end to the end of an integer. Ha ha ha. Okay, that's what I needed to do. So if I kind of bring this back, put the letter N there. Okay. Um... So here's, and, and you might say, well, okay, why? And, and here's the answer to why. With big ints, you can safely store and operate on large integers even beyond the safe integer limit. So in JavaScript, there is um, a value that's considered too big, and it's too big, you start losing precision. Like, it's, it's no longer safe. It's too big. Uh, so you can kind of cast it into a big int, um, what, what do you lose? Well, you can no longer have decimal places. So if you cast your big int into a big int by putting the letter n there, you can no longer have decimal places there. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to store any decimals accurately, but okay, good. So what have we covered? We've covered undefined, we've covered boolean, we've covered number, um, both floating point numbers, uh, let x equals 12 to, and if I do console log type of x, um, you know, we just got done with C sharp and we had, we had floats and we have ints and there was a difference between the two in JavaScript. They're both just type of number. Um, and so that's, that's a thing. Uh, we can make a function called foo. And so, interestingly enough, uh, a, a type of function exists. So if I say type of and I put in the function name of foo, you can see that that data type is function. And there's another type of symbol, which is considered an advanced topic. We don't dive into the, the symbol data type in this course. Okay, and so those are the data types. Again, kind of referenced on that handout. I think that handout's a good thing to kind of um, have by your side, just being familiar with the different data types. Okay, we're about 45 minutes into a lecture, and we'll kind of take a good, good breather here. I'm going to go ahead and pause. Okay, moving, moving on, right? Back to JavaScript fundamentals. Um, one thing that we use to our advantage in JavaScript is that JavaScript statements um, are not even statements. Uh, JavaScript values, um, there's basically two big categories, uh, which is Everything, every value can be categorized of one of two things, which is either truthy or falsy. And it's kind of funny language because, like, um, uh, you know, two equals two is truth, right? But truthy is kind of like, yeah, it's kind of kind of true. We're just gonna we're gonna bucket it into this category of of true. It's not exactly true, but it's Truthy. And so, you know, we use these values, you know, we can use that to our advantage, and you can kind of write things in an if statement. If something is truthy, else, you know, it's falsy. So, um, you can have these different values. Um, that that can be considered truthy or uh, falsy. And so literally you could put the value of false, of course, uh, false would be considered falsy. Of course, the value of true 
um, would of course be truthy. And so you can kind of start to see uh, what, well, what else is considered uh, false. Well, well, zero is a number. So I was like, well, what is zero? Um, zero would be considered a uh, falsy as well. Um, so if, if you put, you know, some sort of like two minus two, you know, uh, in a in an if statement, you get the value of zero, and of course that would that would be uh, considered a false. Um, there's weird things like negative zero, which is also falsy. Um, you put the n, which we just kind of learned that it makes it like a, a big int, but of course a, a, a big int zero is is also. Um, a little bit more commonplace, like if you have an empty string with, uh, with quotes, so we have an empty string, that's considered falsy, just because we do uh, single quotes just to demonstrate it's still falsy with double quotes, makes no difference there. Um, the value of null um, null is falsy you know so if we were to say you know int or uh, uh, let data equals null and then we were to say if data right so if data we would get if there is data well, there is no data, right? So imagine, you know, you read records out of a database. And if that database returns a null value, then, you know, this if statement would be display, display the data, else you would log data not found, right? So, so, you know, recognizing that a null value is considered falsy um, you could use that to your advantage. And again, if there's data there, go ahead and display the data in a table on your page. Otherwise, give the user a message, uh, no data found. So that's very useful. Kind of the same thing here. If, if we declare a, a, a variable, but we do not put anything in it, um, that's considered undefined and undefined as falsy. and um, not a number and so um, I don't think yeah NAN so you can see not a number is a value that you can assign to a variable and you know or, or it can be assigned by the engine right because uh, the engine can determine the type and if you're expecting a number like you're trying to like let's do this let's just do uh, show you how this could happen so if I do parse int and then the letter k well if you try to take a k and parse it to an int you should get not a number which comes back falsely Right, so not a number can happen from, from something like that. Um, okay, so if our data is a, well, any other, any other value besides zero, we're getting truthy. So one and 10, any other non, you know, doesn't really matter. Positive number, negative number, so we say negative number. Well, negative 11 is also truthy. Um, if our data is an array, so we could have an array of data. So one, two, three. And if I check out our array, an array is considered truthy. Uh, an object is considered truthy. Oops. So here we have now we have an object on the right hand side and like I said that should be truthy um, and those are those are examples of values 
um, that, again, they kind of get categorized into truthy or falsy statements. And recognizing this allows us to write some really interesting JavaScript. It's kind of like short, shorthand JavaScript. Um, like those ternary operators are used a lot. Um, remember, a ternary operator says something like this, right? So if we say data is um, null, and we know null is falsy, we could say data uh, question mark. If so, console.log. Um, yes, data. Otherwise, console log no data. Well, remember, this is a ternary operator. It's kind of a fancy if else, right? This is a shorthand if else. Um, so, what are we? The if statement it says if there's data, which we know that that's false, then we would log data yes. Otherwise, we log no data. Um, so, this is a, again, a shorthand. Um, um, now, what did I do wrong? Uh, of course, I would expect that to be falsy, null, true. Sometimes I, I forget. Um, nope, single question mark, console log. Oh, I didn't save, I don't think. Because truthy is not even an option. There we go, no data. Control Control S hotkey. Again, if you don't if you see that little if you see that little dot right there, your your work's not saved. And so I just didn't save in time. Um so this is this is pretty normal to say, hey, you know, put something in a variable and if it's truthy, do one thing. If it's falsy, do something else. And you'll see that you'll see that a lot in this course. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Um, on the JavaScript handout, right? I'm done with falsy, truthy. I'm I'm done with our variables. I'm done with our data types. We are on the looping through an array, and so turns out in JavaScript, there's a bunch of ways to loop. I don't, I, off the top of my head, there's like five loops, you know, maybe maybe more, you know, there's a bunch of loops in JavaScript. Um, so we're just going to go through some of the different syntaxes for um, for loops. Um, I mean, if you type in while and tab, let's see, where's my hotkeys? While, okay, so if I hit tab on this while statement, you get the little code snippet. So just because I like my hotkeys, I type in while and I hit down to this while statement, hit tab. Um, while the array length is greater than zero, Console log ARR um, sub I. We're going to start off I is zero. So let's make a control variable I is zero while um, while. I'm, I'm, I don't need, I'm looking at my notes. While I, let me change, because I, I got crossed on my, my notes. Um, well, I is less than the array.length. Apologies, I just was looking at two different things on my notes. So we start off I at zero. Zero is less than three, which is your array length. Print out array sub zero. And then we increment i, right? Pretty simple loop, right? Um, 
By the way, semicolons are recommended in JavaScript, not mandatory. Um, just a little side note. So, okay, so we loop through using a while loop, pretty simple thing. Um, you know, this is a, what is this? This is a pretest loop, right? So if this, if this statement is false, you'll never enter the body of the loop. Therefore, a while is known as a, a pretest. Um, I can restructure this as a do while, right? So here's a do. And if I, again, using my snippets, um, there's a do while right there. Hit tab. While I is a less than ARR dot length. It's the same difference. But there's, there's one noticeable difference between a while and a do while. Okay, and of course we need to modify I after that. Um, so what, what happened here? Okay, that's kind of a, a good point of saying um, the difference between a while and a do while. Notice this do while is only printing out one. Um, so we print out the first value, which is one, uh, yet is z uh, um, is one less than three. That should be true, and print out my next one. Where am I making a mistake? We log one it goes to one is one less than oh I'm logging the array sub I so I should go to one one less than three I'm making a silly mistake my while loop is breaking um, Okay, so we're starting I at zero. We're printing out sub zero, which is one. I goes to one. Is one less than three? Yes, it is. It should loop back up. Print out array sub one. Let me look closer. Pause. I knew it was a silly mistake, and that's the benefit of working with other people looking at your code. Uh, array dot length, L E N G T H. The array dot length is a property that holds a value of three. Now we get the correct. See, this is the benefit of having multiple eyes on your code. Silly mistakes. Okay, so this is a you know we got a while loop, we got a do while loop, pretty standard stuff. Um, the difference between a while and a do while is that even if this is false, right? So we start off I at zero. Uh, it prints out one and i goes to one is one greater than at any point is is one greater than three no that's false so this is uh this is called a post test loop and now that's functioning as intended because it's still going to run the body of the loop once that's the difference between a while being a pretest and a do while being a uh, post test okay yeah good eye thank you for for seeing my, uh, I don't know how I typed in len instead of length, but uh, just trying to move through. Um, the the beautiful for loop um, takes those three parts. Like there's three, there's an iterator variable here called i, and then there's a modification of the iterator variable, and there's a test. So those are kind of the three parts of a of a loop. Um, a for loop is a beautiful beast because um, it takes all three parts and puts them in one line of code. And so again, using my snippets, I type in four and I go down to my, my second here and I hit tab. Um, you could say I, while I is less than my array, ARR dot length. And then, you know, what, what do you want to do here? Console log ARR sub I. So this is a third way of iterating through an array. 
Um, we're going to use all these, well, primarily a lot of for loops. Um, then there's two other loops in JavaScript. There's a for in and there's a for of. Hey, -o. So I want to show um, for of MDM. And I want to show this on the recording here. Um, there's there's these other loops called for of, and then there's a uh, for in. And these are just again loops to loop over something. You can kind of see here on MDN they recommend the for of, which is a shorthand loop to loop through an array. Um, and you can kind of see the reason it's called the for of is it has the keyword of inside of the uh, parentheses. Okay, versus the for in, um, they're going to loop through objects, right, in a for in. Okay, so um, if you want to do a shorthand over an array, MDN recommends a for of. If you want to do a shorthand for loop over an object, they recommend for in. I might have to get a new laptop. But it smells like it's burning. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's no good. Um, hopefully I don't lose my recording. Okay, so those are your for of and for ins. Um, kind of the syntax here. I'm just going to um, show you here uh, for in over an array, for of over an object. Um, okay. Those are your loops. Covered five different loops. One, two, three, four, five. Um, in JavaScript. So, you know, JavaScript is interesting. You know, to me, it's like there's not one way of doing something. Here's five different ways to loop, you know. Uh, it's kind of the same thing with functions. Uh, here's three ways to declare a function. Um, and so the first one is like the oldest one. And we say three comma four, and you know that's that's going to call the add function, and it's going to return should return seven. Okay, so uh, this is called a function declaration, and I would say that's like the most common syntax that developers are used to. Um, there's another one called a function expression. And I'll create one called subtract, okay, um, which is done with the keyword const And kind of looks like that. Um, and so this now, if I were to call the subtract, and I would say 10 minus 4, we should get back 6. Um, which really, look, doesn't that look just like the one above? Like literally just adds another, but stores it in a variable, right? So that's really interesting and, and worth a deeper dive, like how this actually works. Because you wouldn't think, because literally what we have, what do we have on line nine? It starts with a declaration of a variable. And then in that variable, you assign a function. 
Um, and so that's, that's what we're doing here. We're creating a variable and assigning that variable equal to a function. The function is called subtract, and then when you call the variable, you pass it as parameters. Um, you know, it wasn't until that I realized what's going on here um, that I kind of got into learning that JavaScript is what's called a multi-paradigm language. Um, you know, you've got these um, paradigms like object-oriented programming, right? That's a big paradigm of programming, right? You learn object-oriented programming. You've got functional programming, which is, again, just a from like a how the code works, right? It is, these are, these are different paradigms in how you code in different languages. Well, JavaScript is considered multi-paradigm, and it's because it's multi-paradigm, you can do something like this, which is assigning a function to a variable. That actually comes from a functional paradigm where you do that. So if you've never studied a functional paradigm, this might not make sense to you. Right. And my background, I never I never had studied a functional paradigm. So this was always weird to me. Um, and it just required a little bit more digging to see, oh, it's because JavaScript is considered multi paradigm. And this is something that's kind of done in functional programming um, as opposed to objects. Right. And JavaScript, you, you've already seen that JavaScript can have objects. So you've seen kind of the object oriented nature of JavaScript. This syntax comes from more of that functional programming. Um, so this is a, a, another way of, of creating a function. And here's the third way, which is called an arrow function, which um, we're going to use a lot of arrow functions here. Um, I'll say const multiply x, y, Um, and then arrow. Now, if it's only a single statement, you could just do x times y. And so um, there's actually, we'll, we'll go through, I want to show you this. This article on the arrow syntax on MDN, this is really worth 10 minutes of your time. MDN arrow functions. In understanding how arrow functions can really be short-handed, um, uh, is this the right article? Hold on, let's. Da, 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 da. Um, that might not be the right article. I'm trying to think of uh, what article that I read that really made arrow functions click for me because they're really great for shorthand, uh, making shorthand functions. Um, but anyways, uh, let's just call multiply now and kind of demonstrate the three different types of function declarations and um, calling those functions. Okay, so that's the end of the JavaScript handout. And that brings us back to the lecture notes. Oh, this piece right here, this is what I'm looking for. They show how this can be condensed all the way down into this, right? Just kind of going through these little steps. So the one thing I didn't talk about is an anonymous function. It's just a function without a name um, that we end up wiring up anonymous functions. So you could say, hey, 
when the user clicks a button, run this anonymous function. It doesn't need a name, just run this code. And that code might take one input parameter of A and return A plus 100 and really shorthands that. So yeah, this is what I was looking for. Um, just worth five or 10 minutes of your time. Three ways to write functions. And let's bring this back. Kind of close up some different things we're looking at. Okay, so back to the JavaScript review. We've been using console log. Um, console error is just another method that that logs it is in red like if you're looking at it in the browser it's just another there's also like a console.table there's all these different methods i would add console.table and then you could put like a person object and it'll display the data in a nice table format so console table is really useful we talked about the different variables we talked about the different functions um, an anonymous function is, again, I you typically kind of wire that up on like a, on an event. So you say, hey, the user clicked this, run this function. Um, and here, they kind of show on this arrow syntax, if you have two parameters like I did, I included the, par I included the parentheses. If you have one per parameter, it's mandatory parentheses. If you have zero parameters on an arrow's function, um, and this is returning x plus c, this is returning 5, um, you actually don't need the parentheses, but um, it's good like visually to tell what's going on. So um, recommended to include the parentheses on this third option with zero parameters. Um, and so even it would be like this, const uh, foo equals return a four. And so here, we call foo, and here's an arrow function that just basically returns four. And you can see I'm still... Um, I think what... I'm not sure the syntax here. Uh, it says it's optional, but I'm not sure what to put in place there because I just always include them. So I've never, uh, I've never tried to leave them out. So I'm not sure how to get that to to work. Okay. All right. Um. When it comes to formatting a string and string concatenation, um, here's kind of the syntax is letter D that I want to point out. Um, let me kind of bring this back. Um, And this is the syntax, hello world, you do a dollar sign, um, now, what's going on here? Um, if I do this dollar sign, you're going to notice uh, the quotes on the council log need to actually be back ticks. And so a backtick is a different character. It's not a single quote. Um, and so this is a really nice syntax for kind of doing some string concatenation. We're adding five into our string. So it'll say hello world five. Um, but you need to use this backtick character. And so if I kind of run this here, you can see that we're, we're essentially adding in that value into our string. And so I can just add, you know, let's say hello world mom, whatever. Um, so this is this is a really nice kind of modern way, if you will, modern syntax for adding values into strings. 
but it's just got this one weird off character that's a back tick. Uh, I'm trying to remember the actual name of this character. I always call it back tick, but it's got a different name. Um, but that's that's in syntax here. From different from different languages, you could see you could use the plus symbol for concatenation. You know, on both sides of a variable, all this kind of stuff. Um, if I were to say five point gibberish, and I do x dot to fixed, I could say, hey, how many decimal points do you want to round to? And you can kind of get that, and you could see that it did round up to two decimal places. So rounding did occur. Okay, we did uh, we did kind of cover if statements with ands and ors, our ternary operator. Um, this is kind of cool. So uh, let port equals. Now this is. Um, This will be something that we do. Um, so if we assign a port, and console log data. OK, so we, we assign a port to 5,000. We can say, OK, let's assign a variable called data equal to 5,000. If it's truthy, it'll assign it to, to what's on the left of the OR sign. But if this port is falsy, it'll assign 3,000. So data in this case should be 5,000. But let's say for whatever reason, a port was never assigned or was a falsy value. You can see it'll kind of do one or the other. Um, so this is something that we use in this class to kind of say, OK, Assign a value. If this is truthy, assign that value. Otherwise, assign the other value. So that's kind of cool, which is this piece right here. And this is cool um, because in React, and this is kind of fast forwarding, in React, we could say, okay, if this variable is truthy, then go ahead and render this HTML. And so, um, you know, we could say let data equals, you know, 5,000 or whatever. And then you could say data and, and so these are just some different ways to use. You can write some HTML here and put that data in in like a, an inside of a heading kind of thing. So this says, hey, if this is truthy, go ahead and display this H1. Otherwise, it will not display the H1. Voice is getting sore. Okay, last bit, and then we're gonna take a lunch. Um, last bit here is the difference between synchronous uh, code and asynchronous code. So a lot of what we're going to be um, coding in, in this uh, JavaScript world is going to be considered asynchronous code. And so, you know, I always stop and take a minute and say, okay, what asynchronous versus synchronous? Obviously, if you think about the word synchronous, you know what it means. When things are in sync, they're happening at the same time. So you know what synchronous is. When something is in sync, it's happening at the same time. And so most of the code that we've always written to this point has been synchronous code. Um, kind of one step after the other. You wait for one task to complete, then you go on to task two. You wait for task two to complete, then you go on to task three. And so, you know, one line after the other. But in this JavaScript world, 
you know, it might make sense to run code in an asynchronous format. You know, in examples on, you know, for example, when you're working with a database. So oftentimes when you're working with a database, you know, you might send a request off to the database and it might take five seconds for that, for that database to kind of respond, right? So in that case, does it make sense to just wait for the database response and lag your app, you know? Or does it make sense to kind of let your, your code, your, your process kind of continue to execute your code and then kind of come back to responding to the data once that database responds. Um, so when I think of asynchronous code, that's what I think of. I think of it's it's really there for um, efficiency. It allows a process on a server to kind of continue to execute your code while it's waiting for some sort of task to complete, such as a database response. Um, and then once that task completes, you know, to kind of handle that response um, later. And so I, I kind of, you know, in my mind, and this might be silly, but in my mind, I kind of think of it like you're in the kitchen, right? And if you're doing tasks in the kitchen, right? So let's just say you're making lunch and you got something to microwave. So let's say you get your drink ready. You got your, you got your drink. That was step one, get the drink. Step two is to microwave your soup. So you're going to start that microwave and, and start the soup. And maybe you're microwaving it for two minutes. So in synchronous, in synchronous world, you get your drink ready, and then you kind of start the microwave. You, may, you wait for two minutes for that soup to finish, and then you can toast your bread, right? And the, the bread might take 30 seconds or a minute, right? Let's just go with a minute. And in the synchronous world, you get your drink ready, then you wait two minutes for the microwave, you start the microwave, two minutes later it stops, and then you start the bread, and then the bread stops a minute later, okay? So it took, you know, let's say it took 30 seconds for the drink, plus two minutes for the soup, you know, uh, and then you set your placemat and you eat, whatever. But in an asynchronous world, you get the drink ready, right? Then you can start the microwave, and instead of waiting for the microwave to stop, then you can start the toast. And while you got both, you got both the microwave going and you've got the toaster going, then you can set your placemat with your silverware. And then the microwave goes off, and you can pull, go ahead and respond to that. Go ahead and pull out the pull out the soup. And then the toast goes off, and you can respond to the soup. So in in aggregate, it just takes less time. Right? When you have these tasks that kind of take a while to respond to, you can do other things. And it's the same way with a, 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 in programming. You can kind of free up your resources to do other things uh, and be more efficient so that the total task time takes less time. So now that we're getting into this world of JavaScript and we're going to get into, uh, into this MERN stack, we're going to be doing a lot of asynchronous coding. Um, and when it comes to asynchronous codings, there's kind of three approaches. And I think I'm going to try this. I don't even think we need to address the first two. I think 100% of the time we could just use this async await, right? Because we're learning this for the first time. These other approaches are also considered valid ways to, to write asynchronous code. But in short, they're way more complex. Okay, and we, I, can, I can dive into this and we can, I can show you how to write callbacks and I can show you how to write promises. But in short, it's just not necessary if you can do async awaits. And, and I think I'm just gonna try and just kind of keep it with uh, the Number one, it's the best approach. Um, it's the most modern approach. Um, so I'm just going to teach one of these three approaches for asynchronous programming, which is called async await. Um, and then, and then in this async await, um, you can kind of see if like 
hey, if my database responds with an error message, I might need to wrap it in a try catch. So what it boils down to is we're going to be writing asynchronous code. Number one, understanding what that means, that instead of just going from one task to task two to task three and waiting them to finish, we're, we're kind of freeing up the processor on our server to do other tasks until prior tasks complete. Again, think of that, that uh, kitchen example. And, uh, and this will be a little bit of a learning curve, but it's, it's, not, it's not super difficult. The point is a lot of code built into this is, is asynchronous, and we're going to have to learn this async await on how to, how to code with that, even though we haven't really written any, uh, a whole lot of code yet. Really, our code's just been demos. All right, guys. Well, you've made it through the first lecture. You, you survived? Yeah, I'm doing good. Thank you. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. I'm going to stop here. Stop the lecture here.